Okay. All righty then. We're live, folks. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Wash us in the holy blood of Jesus Christ. Purify us. Cleanse us in the blood of the Lord Jesus, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Father's beloved Son. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Fill us with life and power and wisdom and knowledge and the fruit that comes from the Holy Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Crucify our flesh. Destroy our flesh. Save us from our flesh. Save us from the evils of this world and from satanic temptation. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name, Yahweh, we love you, Father, Holy Spirit. We love you, Father, Holy Spirit. Watch me. Okay, guys, Yahweh, Father, Holy Spirit. We're, we'll begin in a few moments. I think I'm going to do two sessions tonight, if the Lord Jesus wills, if the Lord Jesus pleases. Trusting the Holy Spirit just to fill me with such power and wisdom and knowledge and understanding to interpret scriptures perfectly, correctly for the glory of Jesus. <clears throat> Give me a recall of scripture. And then give us the power to obey the Lord Jesus, right? In Jesus' name, I want to do two sessions. If the Lord Jesus is pleased, yeah, hold the Father. Eat the flesh and drink the blood of our God and save Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not watching your stream, and I'm hearing the sound of Israel's plane, airplane. So where I don't know where you're at. Hey, Medic, how you doing? I want to do one on the salvation issue and probably one on Jesus in Psalm 110.1. Thank you, Medic. I pray Jesus Christ, my Lord, continues to transform all of us. I pray Jesus Christ, our Lord, my Lord, our God, my God, our Lord, our, our love, our life, as the Holy Spirit loosens my tongue to speak for the glory of Jesus Christ, will fill us with more wisdom and knowledge, understanding of the scriptures and the power to live those scriptures, go deeper into the scriptures, to fall more passion love with Jesus Christ. So keep praying for me because <clears throat> it's the Holy Spirit that enables me, the Holy Spirit that empowers me. To teach the word of God for the glory of Jesus Christ. So. Anyway. We'll wait for a few more faces to show up. Hopefully Pablo will show up. What are you going to do? There's going to be no true lasting peace until the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, returns, right? So we're just waiting a few more minutes. Let me bring down the resolution. Hold on. Okay. How's the resolution? I try to bring it down a little more so that it won't buffer. Okay. Any questions before I begin? Yeah. Sam the man always. I mean. I know I start kind of early, but hopefully people start joining. Okay. Okay. Well, if I have to move closer to the router, I will. We'll see, because the router is not too far behind me. Oh, must be nice, Southern California. Well, is was LA in Southern California? My eyes. Is LA in the Southern California? I don't even know where Southern California is. Is that it? Hold on, guys. I can get. All right. Well, God willing, Lord Jesus Christ willing, I'm going to be in the LA area from the 28th. So I'm flying out Wednesday, and I'm going to be in that area till the 15th. I'm going to be doing some pre-recorded shows with a former Muslim who now follows the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to do about 26 pre-recorded shows for a satellite station. And I'll be making the rounds. So if you're in that area, you want to meet me, let me know. If you have a Bible study, you want me to come and teach, contact me. Right? I'm available, folks. Don't worry about money. People think that we charge. We don't. We don't charge. We do it freely by the grace of Jesus Christ. If the people of God want to support us financially, God bless you, right? So don't be afraid. Some people are afraid to man, if I ask him how much it's going to cost, nothing. Yeah, please do hit the like button, okay? 
one day if I keep doing this, if I keep doing sessions, we're going to get to about a thousand viewers every time I go live. Like David, I'm hating on him. You can see I'm jealous. The Lord Jesus preserve you defending Christianity for his glory. No questions. If there's no questions, I'll begin in a minute. I decided to undertake this discussion for the sake of a brother named Pablo, but I guess he's not here. He's probably at work because it's now close to 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, and that would be close to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, meaning New York time, right? It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's 5.35, 6.35, yeah. Okay, let me ask the Lord to bless. <clears throat> we praise you, Father. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, Holy Spirit. Father, have mercy on us, on us. Please, Lord, be patient with us in our failures. We ask that you crucify our flesh. Save us from the stain of our flesh, from the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, boastful pride of life, Father. Cleanse us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Transform us by the power of the Holy Spirit to become more like Jesus Christ. And I need that desperately, Father. Please give me victory to crucify my flesh and help us to walk in the life and the power of your Holy Spirit filled with the fruit of the Holy Spirit, Father. Father, to be in love with you, in love with the Lord Jesus, in love with your Holy Spirit. Father, use me, strengthen me, fill me with the joy of the Lord to be a blessing to your people who are here to, to listen. Bless them, fill them, especially with the joy of the Lord Jesus, Father. Grant us the ability to understand scriptures and anoint my mouth to speak truth and enable me to recall scripture and interpret them correctly by the power of your Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. Save us from the attacks of the enemy. Shield us by your spirit and cover us with the blood of Jesus and cover our loved ones with the blood of Jesus. In my case, my two angels, Father, please. We love you. We need you. We love your son, the Lord Jesus. We need your son, the Lord Jesus. We love and need your Holy Spirit. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants <clears throat> and fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the breath of life, the health I need to glorify you. Please, Father, help us not to be hypocrites, but doer, doers of your word. Please, I ask you for that victory. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Yes, if you want to contact me via email, I have several, but you can try S-A-M. Write this down. S-A-M. S-H-M-N. S-A-M. S-H-M-N at yahoo.com. Christianity is one. Okay, let's send this guy in his merry way. Hold on. Another agent tool of Satan to distract, but in Jesus' name, we rebuke it by the power of the blood of Christ, Jesus our Lord. I don't know why they come to this channel. They don't come here to learn, so anyway. Ma'am, 241. Okay. Yep, that's it. You got it, ma'am. Okay, I will. Anyway, that's fine. Yep, yep. I did it too. Okay. Pablo is not here, but what we're going to do, I want to do two sessions tonight, folks. I'm going to do a session on salvation by the grace of our triune God, which receive as a gift through faith in the perfect work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our God is infinitely beautiful, Asher. May the Holy Spirit fill us with more passionate love for our God, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about salvation by grace in response to a particular form All right. Yep, it's buffering. So pray against that in Jesus' name that our internet stays strong. I hate this, man. But it's okay. I know you guys can endure. Yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to address a particular form of dispensationalism that teaches that the revelation, that it's the blood of Jesus Christ that redeems us, was unknown until it was revealed to Paul as he was sent to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Let me repeat. There's a form of dispensationalism that teaches the revelation that you are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ was something hidden and only revealed when Paul was converted and sent to preach to the Gentiles, right? I'm going to refute that. I'm going to show that belief, that gospel was already proclaimed by our Lord Jesus Christ to the disciples before Paul, and it was even announced in the Hebrew Scriptures, right? Do you understand what I'm trying to accomplish? Right? 
pray for the internet connectivity to stay strong so that Satan doesn't mess with us. When I'm done with that, I'm going to then shut down the live stream and then start another live stream on Jesus in Psalm 110. So if you guys are up, get your dinner, get your snacks, get your popcorn, your drinks. I'm going to do two sessions tonight, if the Lord Jesus is pleased, because I want to try to do as many sessions as I can before I go to L.A., if you're up for it. So this is session one. When I'm done, we'll, we'll close this session and start a new one, Jesus and Psalm 110, one, part two. You guys okay with that? You with me? Are you in the saddle? Are you praying so that we're filled with the Spirit? No distractions, right? Okay. That's a good question. Why do these people invent these things? Now, this is the second part of my discussion. If you go back and listen to the session I did on Saturday, I went in-depth in the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John, and we also looked at Matthew and Mark to demonstrate. So this is part two. You may not be able to follow along if you didn't listen to the first session. I demonstrated that the Lord Jesus Christ, while on earth, preached to both the disciples and unbelievers that the way you are saved is by his sacrificial death. He offers his soul, allows his body to be broken, his bloodshed for the forgiveness of sins and the re redemption of souls, and that this is something you receive by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is going to be the second part, right? So if... You didn't listen to the first part. You missed a lot. That was Saturday. It was the communion of saints, salvation by grace, part five. So I'm going to continue where I left off. Is that okay? You guys with me? Right. So if you're ready, thank our brother Protestant. He's here. He's going to post verses. Thank all the admins for volunteering to admin for me, to help me to maintain a tight ship so we can focus on the beauty and majesty of Jesus Christ. So let's again... Refute this. Did our Lord Jesus teach the apostles while he was on earth? And did the apostles before Paul proclaim that you're saved by the shed blood of Jesus? You're saved by trusting in Jesus Christ, by believing in him. Because this particular form of dispensationalism teaches that up until Paul, the apostles taught that repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ is what saves. God bless you, just me. Keep praying for me to walk worthy of the Lord and to crucify my flesh. And I pray I'll be a blessing for all you guys until Jesus takes me home. All right. Let's go back and review just a few passages to show this is nonsense, right? This is nonsense. This teaching that says they taught that you, that you were saved by repentance and baptism in Jesus' name. And the doctrine that you're redeemed by the blood of Jesus wasn't revealed until Paul was converted and sent to the Gentiles. Nonsense. They all taught the same doctrine. This was made known to the disciples before Paul's conversion. And as Holy Spirit grants me unction, let's look at some statements from our Lord in the Gospels. Let's go to Mark 10, 45. Mark 10, 45. Okay. So follow with me because I'm to systematically destroy this position showing it's unbiblical. And I'm not saying those who teach it are not brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Let me <clears throat> clarify. Those brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ who teach that doctrine, that doesn't mean they're not Christians. It means they're wrong, but they're still brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The word life there, suche, in Greek means soul. He's going to surrender his soul to ransom many. That sure sounds like Jesus saying salvation comes by his death, not by being baptized in his name. Now, I'm going to talk about the role that baptism plays because I don't want to get people upset because there are traditions here that listen to me, Roman Catholics, Orthodox, Coptic, and the Church of the East that believe that water baptism is one of the graces or the grace that God gives <clears throat> as the instrument through which the Holy Spirit is given, original sin is removed, <clears throat> and regeneration takes place. Right? 
So I've discussed that. But guys, is it clear that Jesus says he will offer his soul for our salvation? Sure, it sounds like Jesus already was teaching the Jewish followers of Jesus and their ministry to the Jews. That's how you're redeemed, by my offering up my soul, my life. Is that clear in Mark 10, 45? Okay, let's go to my, Matthew 26, 26 to 28. Matthew 26, 26 to 28. And I pray the Lord Jesus will strengthen my voice, my lungs, my, my throat, my chest, and make sound of my voice pleasing to your ears because it's not pleasing to my ears when I hear myself. Anyway, Matthew 26, 26 to 28. Matthew 26, 26 to 28. Watch here. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. This bread broken is my body that will be broken. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Do you get any clearer than that? Already... At the Last Supper, Jesus is telling the disciples, this cup points to my blood that I'm shedding to purify you, cleanse you of your sins. So the notion that redemption comes by the blood of Jesus was something hidden until Paul's conversion. Where in the world do you come up with that doctrine? Do you see it in Matthew 26, 28? The cup is my blood, which will be shed for many for the forgiveness of their sins. Right? Now, how do you receive it? How do you receive this? First, let's look at Luke 24, 44 to 47. I'm going to decimate this doctrine. And I say this not to be rude or arrogant. And not in the context of saying that this view is a damnable heresy. Those who believe in it, they're wrong, but they're still brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ who are saved by the grace of the triune God. So I don't want you to misunderstand. If someone believes this, you can agree to disagree and debate passionately, but that doesn't mean they're not brothers and sisters in Christ. Right? They may not consider you a brother or sister, but that's fine. Luke 24, 44 to 47. Here, our Lord Jesus Christ, after his resurrection, before his physical ascension into heaven, notice what he says to the disciples. He says, before Paul, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses, the law of Moses, and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. See, then he opens their mind by the Holy Spirit's power and grace, right? Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Now notice what he's going to show them from the scriptures, okay? And said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. So that's what the scriptures prophesied. The prophets received revelation, the Holy Spirit revealed to the prophets, and they recorded that revelation, that Christ would suffer and rise on the third day, and that, notice 47, the key, repentance and remission of sins, forgiveness of sins, should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now, let's look at just, yeah, let's look at two and John. Let's go to John 3, 16 to 18, the classic one. God is infinitely good. John 3, 16, 18. Thank you. I pray that I live out the Bible perfectly, not just recall it. So thank you for that, Miss Nobody. Yeah. John 3, 16, 18. So I'm going to dissect this doctrine and show why it's not biblical. This is the second part. Okay. John 3, 16 to 18. Watch here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, believeth in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. Pay attention to that. Here, John, our Lord Jesus Christ, speaking, long before Paul's conversion, <clears throat> says that everlasting life <clears throat> is your possession by believing in Christ, trusting in Christ. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now watch verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. 
But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So long before Paul's conversion, our Lord on earth and the Apostle John records by inspiration of the Holy Spirit that this everlasting life is our present possession. When we believe in Christ, trust in him, our Lord and Savior. Okay? How do you receive the Holy Spirit of life? How do you receive the Holy Spirit of life? John 7, 38 to 39. John 7, 38 to 39. Let's see. And I'm going to add some more points and some of their objections and show you why they have no basis. I'm going to bring one major objection. We're going to deal with that now. And I'm going to deal with the passage they often quote to show that, see, up until Paul's conversion, the apostles, when they preach to the Jews, they pr preach, repent, and be baptized. Now, notice what our Lord says. Pay attention, please. I pray by the power of the Spirit you understand these words so that you'll know what the true doctrine of salvation is. John 7, 38, 39. He that believeth on me, our Lord speaking, he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Right? He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. By believing, right? And what is the rivers of living water? Pay attention to 79. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. So if you believe on him, you receive the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, but because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Question everyone. Thank you, Knight of Christ. I receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. How do you receive the Holy Spirit according to the Lord Jesus long before Paul's conversion? According to what we just read here, how do you receive the Holy Spirit of life? How do you receive the Holy Spirit of life? According to Jesus long before Paul's conversion. Believing, right? Everyone got it? Those who are to believe in him would receive the Holy Spirit, right? So I'll make sure you're following with me. Faith, yeah, believing, trusting in him. The reason why I say this is because this is found on the lips of the Lord Jesus while he was on earth, long before Paul's conversion. Now let's see if Paul preaches the same thing. Galatians chapter 3, verse 2. Galatians chapter 3, verse 2, verse 5, and verse 14. So Protestant believer, I'm going to repeat it again. Galatians chapter 3, verse 2, verse 5, and verse 14. So it's chapter 3 of Galatians, verses 2, 5, and 14. Okay. Watch here. We're going to see. This only what I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of law or by the hearing of faith. Now, obviously... They received the Spirit when they heard the gospel and had faith, believed in it. So this is what Paul is saying. Why are you now running to keep the law to be saved? Didn't you already receive the Holy Spirit when you heard the gospel and believed? You received the Spirit by faith in the gospel. That's exactly what Jesus said. Again, rebuking them, Galatians 3, verse 5. He, therefore, that ministered to you, serves you. The Spirit gives you the Holy Spirit and works miracles among you. The one who gave you the Spirit and worked miracles among you. Did he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Obviously, you received the Holy Spirit and saw miracles and did miracles because you had faith in what you heard from the gospel. By believing the gospel, you were given the Spirit and you did miracles. Galatians 3.14 That the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Wait. Wait. How is that different to what Jesus said in John 7, 38 to 39? By the way, is the quality of the picture good? Is the quality of the picture good for you guys? Do you want to make sure? How is that different from what Jesus said in John 7, 38 to 39? Okay, hold on. Let me then. Okay, I went to 360. Hopefully it's better. Is it better now? Okay, good. I went to 360. So anyone who tells you 
that the gospel no but 720 then it starts buffering we'll see let me just stay here if this is not good enough i'll go to 720 hold on man. let's do 480 then okay i did 480 let's see okay i did 480 let's see let's stay there and see if it works is it okay now the picture All righty then. All right, then I'm going to try 720, folks. Let's go to 720. Sorry, what are we going to do? All right, let's go here. Okay, I went to 720 now. All right, I went to 720. This is the best we can get. So 720, all right. We did 720, folks, the highest resolution possible. But I don't want it to start buffering. Well, it's okay. We're going to have to do what we can. See? All right. Is that right? Boy, technology, dude. Stinks. Before I move on, I just want to make sure everyone okay? How's it now? We were sailing along. Oh, my way. Is it okay now? Much better? I'm in 720 resolution, so I don't know. All righty then. Hold on. Okay, let's do this then. Let's go by the router. Sorry, guys. I got to do this. Okay, let's go by the router. Router, router. Why don't you stop telling me what to do, man? You're not the boss of me. Hold on. Okay. We were sailing along. Sorry, guys. Technology. I'm not rich, and I don't have a studio. This is the best I can, you know. And the moonlight, man. All right. <laughs> Ah, life. All righty, then. Let's go. Hold on. You asked for it. You asked for it, buddy. Okay, how's it now? How's it now? Sorry, guys. We're doing our best with the technology we have. Okay. Okay, I took it down to 360. Okay, I took it down to 360. I don't know what's going on with the resolution. Unbelievable. All right. I did 480 now. Okay, sorry guys, this is all we can do. If the picture is too bad, I can just shut it down. Do you guys want me to shut it down? All right, I don't want to be a distraction to you guys. Hold on. All right. Okay, sorry. Listen, guys, this is the technology. Okay. This is the best we can do, so fine. Okay. I did for you. We'll see. In Jesus' name, Lord, have mercy. I'm on a PC. I'm not on a phone. I can't do it on a phone. Okay, Okay, folks. All right. So far, you found it, right? At least we've established. So someone says it has lag. Does everyone else have lag? Are you okay? Okay. Yeah, Precious, let me stop right now in the middle of my talk and try to hook it up to the ethereal cable, which I don't know what that is, and lose more time. I love you, Precious, but you're not too precious right now with your, with your advice. Don't let me come and lay hands on you. Okay, that's good. In Jesus' name, please, Father, bless this session for your glory. It's for your glory in Jesus' name by the power of the Spirit. Okay. All right. Anyway, anyway, you let me know if picture doesn't get any better okay but you guys got it right you guys got it jesus before paul before paul showed up 
Jesus Christ, before Paul showed up, taught, you receive the Holy Spirit of life by believing in him. So where in the world do you come up with that this doctrine that you are redeemed by the blood of Christ through faith in Christ was something hidden until Paul was converted and sent to the Gentiles? Where do we come up with that? It's not in the scriptures. If you rightly handle the word of truth and interpret scripture correctly, you will see that Paul preached the same gospel that the apostles preached from the beginning, which they received from the Lord Jesus, which was prophesied in the Hebrew Bible. Okay? But here's where they're going to get you, and this is what I want to focus on. Okay? Here's where they're going to get you. Pay attention to this. They'll tell you nowhere... Okay, nowhere in the book of Acts will you find the apostles talking about Jesus dying for your sins, shedding his blood to forgive you of your sins, and receiving that gift by faith. Did you know that? That's one of their objections. They'll say, if you read the book of Acts, Peter nowhere, the apostles nowhere, follow with me, guys, right? Apostles nowhere taught that Jesus died on the cross for, for your sins, or shed his blood to wash you of your sins. So that this somehow proves their position. By the way, they're right. Did you know that? Did you guys know they're right? If you read the book of Acts, so I'm going to challenge you. you got some homework to do. You guys ready for the homework? How many of you guys are ready for the homework assignment? Who's ready for the homework assignment? I want you to read the book of Acts this week. Okay. What I want you to do is I want you to read every time the apostles preach to unbelievers. I want you to count the number of times they mention Jesus was killed on the cross, hung on the tree for our sins. He died for our sins or that he shed his blood to wipe away our sins or that the blood of Christ cleanses us. They never say that. You will not find a single place in the book of Acts where they say that. Do you know that? Nowhere when they preach the death of Christ do they connect the death of Christ with our sins in that Christ was killed on the cross to pay the debt of our sin. He died, hung on the tree in our place as punishment for our sins. And they do not preach to unbelievers. They do not preach to outsiders that the blood of Christ washes us of our sins. You know that? So they say, you see, it's because they did not know that until the conversion of Paul and the revelation given to Paul for the Gentiles. Okay, now I'm, they're, they're right. Now, does that prove that this form of dispensationalism is correct, that the message that you're redeemed by the blood of Christ, which you received by faith, was something unknown until Paul's conversion, where God then revealed it to Paul for the Gentiles. Are they right? No, they're wrong. Do you know why? You know why they're wrong? Can anyone get tell me why? Besides what we read from the Gospels, from the words of the Lord Jesus himself while he was on earth. Put that aside. Let's focus on Acts because that's their argument. In Acts, none of them ever proclaim that the blood of Jesus washes you of your sins or that Jesus was killed on the cross for our sins, because he was taking the punishment of our sins upon him. You know why they're wrong? Guess. Come on, get someone guess. Anyone say, can anyone tell me? Yeah, Loris, they're not saying that Paul preached a false gospel, Loris K. They're saying that Paul preached the gospel. That was revealed for the first time to Paul and which the apostles confirmed being from Jesus Christ. So they'll say, okay, and so yeah, he, they did confirm because they knew that gospel was given to him by Jesus Christ. No, here, here's the answer. How do you do, Mighty Mouse? The answer is that not even Paul in the book of Acts ever mentions the blood of Jesus washing us of our sins. Not even Paul in the book of Acts ever connects the death of Christ on the cross for our sins. 
So if they're going to argue that way, they prove too much. They prove that even Paul didn't know that doctrine because nowhere in the book of Acts, hear me out, you got to hear this argument by the power of the Holy Spirit. Nowhere in the book of Acts will you find Paul saying, Christ was killed on the cross for our sins. He died on the cross to pay the debt of our sin, to take the punishment of our sin upon himself on the cross. And nowhere in the book of Acts will you find Paul preaching to unbelievers the blood of Christ redeems you and washes you of your sins. Paul doesn't even preach that either. So if they're going to use Acts to prove that this gospel was unknown to the followers of Christ up until Paul's conversion, because they didn't go around preaching this gospel to outsiders, unbelievers, well, neither did Paul preach it. Lawrence, why are you debating me, sister? Can I ask you why are you debating me? I don't get what you're trying to do when I just said that they're going to say Galatians 2 simply confirms that they were aware and were convinced by Jesus Christ that Paul received this gospel from Jesus Christ and it wasn't in conflict with them. Okay. So let's keep it on this issue. Keep it on this issue. It is true that you will not find, let me repeat, it is true that you will not find, let me repeat, in the book of Acts, any of the apostles, not even Paul, when they're preaching to outsiders, when they're preaching to outsiders, saying, Christ hung on the tree, was killed on the cross for our sins. He was being punished for our sins. That's why he died on the cross. That's true. But even Paul didn't preach it. It is also true in the book of Acts, none of the apostles, not even Jesus himself, not even, Je I'm sorry, not Jesus, I'm sorry. Paul himself, right? Because I was thinking of Jesus Christ, our God, our love, our life, hanging on the tree. Not even Paul in the book of Acts, no apostle, not even Paul in the book of Acts, ever mentioned to unbelievers, the blood of Jesus cleanses you, wipes you from all your sins, and redeems you. you do you know that? Lower, they don't need to say he had a new revelation, Galatians 2, because Galatians 2 is 14 years later after that revelation of this new gospel was made known to Paul, and they had already come to the realization that this was a gospel given to him by Christ. So they didn't need to say 14 years later, oh, wow, new revelation, Paul. They already knew it 14 years earlier. That's how they're going to respond to you. Don't use weak and bad arguments that they'll refute you very easily. Listen more than pontificating and i say this in love i know you're going to get upset that i'm being but you're not listening all right okay so did you understand how to address this objection no medic they don't teach that let me repeat it again medic this is why you guys had to be paying attention to the first part of this session which was on saturday and then listen. Let me repeat it again. I don't know why you guys are confused. Listen. This form of dispensational teaches that when the apostles were sent out by Jesus Christ to preach the gospel to the Jews before Paul's conversion, they preached repentance and getting baptized in the name of Jesus Christ is what forgives you and gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the revelation that you are redeemed by the blood of Jesus through faith was kept hidden until Paul's conversion, because that would be the gospel, that Paul would be sent out to preach to the Gentiles. How many times have I repeated this, brethren? Okay. I started the first part of this refutation Saturday. If you go Communion Saints, Salvation by Grace, part five. This is the second part. Guys, if you're not watching these sessions, you're going to get confused. Right? So do you understand what they're claiming now? Do you understand what you're what they're claiming now? Before I move on, I know you got it first, last, and Protestant got it too. I want everyone else to get it. Okay. What's their proof? Nowhere in the book of Acts. Let me repeat their proof so I can refute it. Yeah. Mandrake, let me show you how confused I am. 
Here, let me show you. Block this guy because I'm going to send him to Asheron, where he and the other demons like him dwell. Send him back to Asheron. Right? Not hidden, first last. Block him. Not hidden. Love you, bro. Okay. All right. Send him back to Asheron. Okay. Send him back to Asheron. Okay. Now, what's their a proof? One of their proofs is, in the book of Acts, the apostles never preached that you're redeemed by the blood of Christ or that Christ was killed on the cross for our sins. And they're right. But what they don't tell you is neither do you find Paul preaching that in the book of Acts. So none of them preach that. Are you listening to me? Even Paul in the book of Acts did not preach to unbelievers that the blood of Christ washes you of your sins and that Christ died on the cross for your sins. Even Paul didn't preach that in the book of Acts. So that means if they're going to use that argument, it proves too much. It refutes them because it shows that even Paul didn't know it. Uh, better than your mother and father, hepatic addict. Because your parents, that's where <clears throat> Hitler learned from their mind Kampf. Right? Let me muzzle some dogs right now. The demons have come out. Good. Say it, baby. Say it. That's right. Hey, you. Right. Anyway. Okay, so do you understand their argument so I can refute it? Do you understand their argument so I can now refute it? Praise Jesus Christ, our Lord. Where are you guys going tonight? Okay. So, did Paul in the book of Acts ever mention... To unbelievers, Jesus shed his blood you or died on the cross for your sins? No. So if you ever run into this group and they say, they didn't preach that message, they say, well, neither did Paul. The only time that Paul mentions the blood of Christ in the book of Acts is in the context of his final instructions to the elders at, at Ephesus. The Ephesian elders, he summons them and gives them final instructions as he's about to depart. Let's go to Acts 20, verse 17. And then read 27 to 29. Acts 20, verse 17, and then verses 27 to 29. No, Sam is not saying that, mighty mouse. But thank you for assuming that's what I said. Anyway, let's go to Acts 20, 17, and then 27 to 29. See, because you guys are not patient, you're not going to get the answer. A medic already wants me to answer the question that I'm about to answer slowly and systematically. Orthodox is the only confused way. Hold on. You know, I, I've said it, and I'm going to say it again. You got jerks and you got nasty fanatics in every branch of Christianity. You got nasty jerks that are Protestants. You got nasty jerks that are Catholics. Nasty, pitiful jerks that are Orthodox. So being a jerk is not <clears throat> unique to any particular branch of Christianity. In the last few days, I went to some very nasty, divisive, arrogant Orthodox jerks. Nasty, right? Now, don't get me wrong. There are beautiful, born-again, spirit-filled believers in every major branch of Christianity. So I don't want you to misquote me here. I'm okay. All right. Sorry for the lag. So I do believe there are spirit-filled believers in every major branch of Christianity. Orthodox, Coptic, Nestorians. That's my belief. But in the last few days... These nasty, divisive, arrogant, orthodox jerks have been coming out of the woodwork, contacting me and telling me they're the only true church. And, and, and one in particular had a YouTube page where he's going after Coptics and Christian prints in the most nasty manner, and you guys think I'm a jerk. These guys make me look humble. They make me look like a choir boy. Right? Nasty, man. So we got jerks that just are an embarrassment to their denomination all across the board. Nada, 
you're one of those Orthodox that happens to be beautiful, a born again sister who loves Jesus. So, but I'm being honest with you, sister. You got some jerks in your own branch and your, you know, backyard, as Catholics do, as Protestants do, and all the branches of Protestantism. So don't take it personally, right? But just tell your Orthodox brothers and sisters, man, dude, stop it, man. I mean, if I show you some of the things they've been telling me, I mean, come on. Wow, man. Nasty, nasty, dude. I don't like it when you have a Roman Catholic who may attack an Orthodox. And I don't like it when Orthodox attacks Roman, Roman Catholics. And I definitely don't like it when the Roman Catholics and the Orthodox attack the Coptics or the Nestorians, right? And this is the problem. Let me just real quickly. This is the problem with claiming to be apostolic. Claiming apostolic succession and claiming to be a church founded by the apostles because all of these major apostolic churches that historically have lineage to the apostles, they all claim that they are the true apostolic church that have maintained the correct interpretation of the teaching of the apostles and the others have lost their way. Roman Catholics tell me that about the Orthodox. The Orthodox tell me that about the Roman Catholics. The Coptics tell me that about the Roman Catholics and the Orthodox. And everyone tells me that about the other. And here you are trying to convince me to be either Orthodox or Roman Catholic or Coptic and saying, see, read the fathers. They were Orthodox. But then the Catholics tell me, read the fathers. They were Catholic. But then the Coptics tell me, read the fathers. They're Coptic. In other words, appealing to church fathers doesn't solve the problem. It only adds to the confusion. Just like Dominus Telsum just said, it was founded by Peter. Dominus, the Roman Catholic Church was founded by Peter, right? Exactly. King of Kings, you know I'm not one of those who don't doesn't admit my shortcomings. I'm probably one of the most honest apologists, and I'm not trying to be humble about it. I'm being honest. I am telling you, I am a jerk. I got anger issues. I'm impatient. Do I want to be that way? No. I'm begging Jesus day and night, crucify my flesh. If there's any demonization where demons are attacking my flesh and pricking me, save me, Lord, by the power of your blood. I don't want to be that way. Get my point? But at least I'm honest. I'm telling you, these are my shortcomings. I'm a jerk. Please don't mess with me so I don't have to act in the flesh and grieve the spirit so I can be a blessing to you. But the others who, who claim to be holier than thou on a high horse, they'll come and say, you're not being Christ-like, brother, and then start attacking me personally. Oh, you hypocrite, your beams are sticking out and, and hitting me in the face. Ow, watch out for that beam, dude. I can dive off of your beam. All right, anyway, sorry for that rant. Sorry for that uh, excursion. Let's get back to the issue. And pray for me, folks. I am not perfect. I'm a sinner who struggles to crucify my flesh. Can you please pray God will give me this victory finally to die to impatience and anger. Lord Jesus, for your glory, so I don't be a stumbling block without being compromising or wishy-washy, right? But let me give you advice. Orthodox, please, please stop attacking other branches of Christianity before me. You're just going to disgust me. Roman Catholics, please, let me say it again. Roman Catholics, please, Stop attacking other branches of Christianity in front of me. You're just going to disgust me. And Protestants as well, critique a doctrine, but stop attacking people from other branches of Christianity. Critique the doctrine because you're going to disgust me. Even this doctrine that I'm critiquing, notice what I said. I said this form of dispensationalism, those who adhere to it, who teach this gospel, they're still brothers and sisters in Christ. They're wrong, but that doesn't mean they're heretics who are not saved. They are my brothers and sisters in Christ. You see? Now, they may not extend that courtesy to me. That's fine. Okay. Now, let's get back to the issue. Sorry for that excursion and that rant. But sometimes I got to go on a rant because people come in here. Orthodox church is a true church. You Protestants, you, you, you don't have... You know the presence of Christ, and you're not a true church, and and you know there is no charism in your church. Wow, that's really going to convince me to consider your church after you just bashed me as a Protestant. I'm ready now to get baptized in your church. Come on, man, man. So let me say again, 
If you want me to consider the truth of your church, do not attack me as a Protestant. Do not attack my Protestant brothers and sisters. Do not attack other churches. Just tell me, here's a link. Here's a video. Consider the arguments, but don't give me a link in a video to a jerk who attacks other Christians as false heretics. And let the Spirit work in me, as, as I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to work in you. All right? I'm telling you, because someone was trying to get me to talk to a brother who converted to orthodoxy. And I said, dude, I told you don't proselytize me. Don't disrespect me. Don't proselytize me. Right. Nada, go to the, well, I'm going to be advertising his YouTube channel. Then you haven't been around long enough. There's a particular orthodox who contacted me who has a channel with the name orthodox in it. I don't want to give him free advertisement. Go and see how nasty this jerk is. He attacks Christian prince. He attacks the Coptics, calls them false heretics. So just because you're not exposed to the jerks in your own camp, we have been exposed to them. Yes, Darius Cole. The Orthodox rely on the apostolic tradition, which they believe was passed on to their bishops, which they have preserved in absolute purity, unlike the Catholics who have lost their way. Yes, Darius. Guys, I hope I didn't upset you with that excursion, that rant. Is that okay? And this is coming from a guy who just a few years ago was very vicious against some Roman Catholics and attacked them and said things that I asked God to forgive me for saying and have mercy on me. Because I'm, I'm imperfect too and I get angry. In Jesus' name, let's begin. Let's go back to the point because I'm going to do two talks tonight, folks. After I finish this talk, I'm going to wrap it up, but then I'm going to start another live stream on Jesus and Psalm 110. If you guys want to stick around for a long night, because I want to do as many shows as I can before I leave Wednesday to LA, Lord Jesus willing. Right? Okay. Coming back to the topic. The book of Acts, none of the apostles, not even Paul, preached. That Christ died on the cross for our sins. That he allowed himself to be killed on the cross to take the penalty of our sins. Nor did they preach that Jesus shed his blood to cleanse you of your sins, of our sins. The only time, the only time that Paul mentioned, mentioned the blood of Christ was in the context of instructing the elders at Ephesus, the Ephesian elders, as he was giving them final <clears throat> commands, final instructions, <clears throat> because Paul believed that that would be the last time he would see them. Let's go to Acts 20, verse 17, and 27 to 29. Acts 20, verse 17, and then verses 27, 29. So Protestant, it's Acts chapter 20, verse 17, and 27, 29. Notice to whom Paul is speaking. These final instructions Paul, by inspiration of the Spirit, is giving them to who? Read. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. These are what you would call the bishops. Elders are bishops, right? Episcopos, presbyteros. They're asking way of butchering the Greek, okay? And called the elders of the church. And then speaking to them, notice what he says. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Did you catch it? This is the only time in Acts Paul mentions the blood of God, showing that Jesus is God in the flesh. Notice it's the blood of God, which he shed to purchase the church. But this is a message that he, he directed to the elders not to the unbelievers, right? And then verse 29. And John, you personally, hold on, my friend. I love you, John, and this is why it hurts me to do this, John. Dear John, dear John, hold on, dear John. Dear John, sorry, John, I love you, man. I loved you, man. You hurt me, John. You hurt me. 
You hurt me, friend. You hurt me, bro. Sorry, John. I had to do that, bro. All right. Acts 20, 29. For I know this, that after my departing and grievous wolves entered among you, not sparing the flock. Right? Did you quote all of 29? There's something missing from 29, unless I'm wrong. Yep, you didn't quote all of it, Protestant. There's something missing about 29. We know that's a historical fact. I don't see all of it. There's a, there's a part in which it says, even from among you, that's not it. There's a part missing, trust me. Even from among you, right? Right, post it again. There's a part missing. It goes that even among yourselves, they'll, they'll fall away to take people away from them. See? Thank you. Verse 30, man. See? I knew. I should have went to 30. Thank you, man. I love you, bro. Now we lost the whole point. Let's try it again. I love you, man. Let's do Acts 20, verse 17 and 27 to 30. Acts 20, verse 17 and 27 to 38, because I had that verse in my mind as well. The key verse is 28. It's 28, but I'm going to read it again, because notice how many attacks, distractions, folks, how many attacks and distractions to keep me from refuting this doctrine. You know this is spiritual warfare, right? Acts 20, verse 17. Acts 20, verse 17, 27, 30. This photographic memory is the grace of the Holy Spirit that enables me to call Scripture for His glory. Okay, let's read it again. Acts 20, 17. We're going to read to 30. Guys, pay attention. Read with me. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. So notice it's elders, believers appointed to oversee the church. He's talking to believers, not outsiders. It's in this context that Paul says the following. For I have not sh uh, shunned to declare to you, I have not shunned, to declare to you <clears throat> all the counsel of God, take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, hath made you overseers to feed the church. You elders, you are shepherds to feed the flock of God, which is the church of God, which God purchased with his own blood. Wow. For I know this, that after my departing, Shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock, also of your own selves, even among you, people who confess to be believers, who walked in fellowship with you, will arise speaking perverse things, even among you, heretics will arise, perverting the truth and drawing disciples away after them. Do you see the warning? Do you guys catch the warning here? Okay, what's the point here? When Paul mentioned in Acts 20, 28, you have been appointed by the Holy Spirit to oversee and feed the flock of believers, the church of God, the church that God purchased by his own blood. When Paul mentioned God purchasing the body of believers by his blood, by his blood, was he speaking to unbelievers or is this a message to believers who were born of the Spirit, appointed to lead the church, oversee the church? One means yes, two means no. Okay, now let me unpack Acts 20, 28 a little more. And then we're going to refute this doctrine. Let's Acts 20, 28 a little more. One more time, he's going to pause Acts 20, 28 and let's unpack it. Watch here. One more time. I want to bring out the meat. How you doing? Eli, how are you, brother? God bless every one of you. Acts 20, 28. Let's unpack this. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Number one. Let's unpack the meat. Number one. Number one. It is the Holy Spirit who sets apart, chooses among born-again believers to become elders, bishops of the church. In other words, 
someone who's truly a bishop called to be an elder of the church is something that that person didn't choose for himself. It was chosen for him by the Holy Spirit. Notice it's the Holy Spirit who decides who will be an overseer, a bishop of the church of Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit who decides who will be a Bible teacher. It's the Holy Spirit who decides who will be a deacon or deaconess. The Holy Spirit decides this. That means you have people who are in a position of leadership who shouldn't be in that position because that wasn't from the Holy Spirit. So you have a lot of leaders and Bible teachers who shouldn't be teaching or leading because it wasn't the Holy Spirit's calling on their life. They assume that position against the wish of the Holy Spirit. And if you assume a position that's not from the Spirit, all you're going to end up doing is creating greater damage and disunity. You with me there? Why do you think I keep asking every one of you? Do you believe? Do you believe? That the Holy Spirit has anointed me and appointed me and set me apart to teach. Why? Because the Bible says from the mouth of two or three witnesses. In this case, believers who know the Lord and born of the Spirit will confirm a matter. Why do you think I keep asking? Because if the Holy Spirit has called me to teach, no power in all creation will stop me from teaching and cause me to fail. Because the Almighty Holy Spirit is my God, my shield. It's his calling, and he will perfect it in me and preserve me for the glory of Christ. You get my point? Okay. So what did you learn from Acts 20, 28? The Holy Spirit chooses who will lead the body of Christ. And he'll make it known to that person because he'll put that conviction, desire in that person's heart and confirm it by the mouth of multiple witnesses, witnesses who are born of the Spirit, part of the body of Christ. You get my point? I love Andrew Martin. Andrew, I'm telling you, you're going to be falling in love with Jesus and preaching next to me in Jesus' name. Right? That means there are people who are in positions of eldership, which they assume not because the Holy Spirit appointed them to that position, but they assumed it on their own initiative because of their fleshly desires. You get you see it? That's the first thing I want you to take away from Acts 20, 28. That's the first thing I want you to take away from Acts 20, 28. The Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit made you overseers. Man, Andrew, coming from you, that blesses my heart. The best teacher in 50 years, my goodness. That all glory to the triune God, all glory to the Holy Spirit, my God, my Lord, my love, my life. The Holy Spirit, please convict this man. Bring him to the feet of Jesus. He misses Jesus. He hungers for Jesus. Holy Spirit, we come in agreement. Bring Andrew back to the feet of Jesus. All right. Okay. In time, Zena, don't put pressure on this young man. Leave him be. He's in the hands of the Holy Spirit. He can run, but he can't hide. We're not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit loves him more than he can imagine, and he's not going to escape the Holy Spirit. So let the Holy Spirit work in him, Zena. Just love him. Love on him. Love on him. That's it. We don't make people believers. We don't make people fall in love with Jesus. The Holy Spirit does. Just love on him. That's it. All right? Anyway. Okay, so that's my point. Now, the second part of the verse, Acts 20, 28. Acts 20, 28. Let's look at it again. Yes, uh, Captain Ron, I'm tempted to show you the door. It's a pretty door, too. It's colored, and there's, like, design on it. Acts 20, 28. Let's read the second part. Over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. God has blood, folks. God purchased the church, the body of believers, united to Christ by his blood. The blood of God purchased the body of believers, purchased you and I. God has blood, folks. That's what you meant, Captain Ron? Man, I love you, bro. <laughs> Captain, I love you, brother. I thought you meant show him the door, like get rid of him. 
that just tells you how crazy I am because I bounce everyone. I love you, Captain Ron. Both you and me have entered that door of salvation. And in Jesus' name, he'll enter too. And by the way, the door of salvation is pretty, right? It's beautiful because that door has been beatified by the blood of Jesus, okay? Guys, God has blood, Acts 20, 28. Did you catch it or no? God has blood, folks. Okay. But hold on. God is spirit, folks. How can God have blood? God is spirit, Acts 20, 28. It says, God purchased the church by his blood. God is spirit. He has no blood. Or does he? Yes, when God became a flesh and blood human being in the person of Jesus Christ. So Acts 20, 28 is one of the passages that identify Jesus as the God who shed his human blood to purchase the church. Amazing? No, it is, Andrew. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to show that here, the God who shed his blood to purchase the church is Jesus Christ, the Son who is God who became flesh. Now, here's what's amazing. As God, our Lord Jesus has no mother, only a father. Because there is no goddess in the Godhead. All right? As man, as a human being, Jesus has a mother, but has no human father. So Jesus, as God, has a father, no mother. But in respect to his humanity, as a man, he has a mother, no father. Tell me he's not amazing. Seek the truth. The God-man died on the cross without ceasing to exist. I know what you're trying to say, but I'm going to embarrass you. If you try to use the argument, how can God die? Because I'm going to use the Quran to embarrass you if you're a Muslim. Because I think Seek the Truth is a Mohammedan who likes to kiss a black stone thinking he's still a monotheist. Right? So don't go there. As God, Jesus has a father, no mother. As man, he has a mother, no father. How amazing is he? And just like Jesus existed before his mother conceived him and begot him, Jesus has always existed with the father, even though the father begot him. Are you with me? Let me let me re, let me repeat what I just said. Just like Jesus already existed before his blessed mother conceived his physical body, human nature by the spirit in her blessed consecrated womb. Right. He existed before his mother begot him. So, too, Jesus has eternally existed with God, the father, even though he was begotten by the father. And I'll talk more about that in future sessions. Is that clear now? You understanding my point? Yeah, don't let the Muslim, the Mohammedan, Muhammad's worshiper, distract you from the topic because he's another agent of Satan trying to get you confused. Focus on the beauty of Jesus because Muhammad is under the feet of Jesus, burning in hell, experiencing the wrath of Christ. Right? And I mean, Jesus as God clearly has no divine mother. Seek the truth. Let me finish my topic. You can ask sincere questions. If you're sincere, I'll answer your questions. But let me finish the topic. If you're here to hit and run and blaspheme, you won't last long. Okay? You with me there? So you got it, right? Okay, what's the point? Let's come back to the point so everyone follows me. What's the point? The only time Paul mentions the blood in the book of Acts, follow me. The only time Paul mentions the blood in the book of Acts is in reference to his final instructions to believers, overseers of the church at Ephesus. It's to them he mentions the blood of Christ. But in the book of Acts, when Paul preaches salvation, like the apostles before him, like the apostles before him, Paul in Acts or at least Acts never records Paul ever saying to the unbelievers that he's preaching to, pay attention to this, to unbelievers he's preaching to, Christ shed his blood to forgive you of your sins. 
to redeem you by his blood. Christ died on the cross because of your sins. Paul never preached that in the book of Acts. He may have preached it, but Acts never records it. Are you with me there? Because I want to wrap it up real soon. But you with me there? Do you understand my point? Okay. What does that mean for this form of dispensationalism? If this type of dispensationalist tells you, you see, none of the apostles of Christ preached that Christ died on the cross for their sins or shed his blood to wash them of their sins. Therefore, this revelation that were redeemed by the blood of Christ wasn't made known until Paul's conversion when he was sent to preach to the Gentiles. You turn it against them. Say, wait, 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 wait. If you're going to use the book of Acts, that same book of Acts refutes you because neither did Paul preach in the book of Acts. Acts nowhere records Paul. Acts nowhere records Paul saying to unbelievers when he's preaching, the blood of Christ redeems you. Re you see that blood by faith or Christ died on the cross for your sins. So you're proving too much. Yeah, leave, seek the truth alone. He's going to ask me questions one-on-one, -on -one, I'll answer, God willing. You see how this very objection backfires against them? You see? So now someone asked me a question. Why is it in the book of Acts, neither the apostles that walked with Jesus on earth, nor the apostle Paul who was converted after Christ went to heaven, Ever preach to unbelievers, Christ died on the cross for your sins and shed his blood to redeem you? That was the question, right? Medic, I'll answer that in a moment. Someone asked me that question, why? Now, let me answer that. You ready for, me, for the answer? You ready for the response? Why did they teach that in the book of Acts? Well, that's an argument from silence. The book of Acts is not an exhaustive record of all the places that the apostles went to and all the peoples they preached to. Therefore, just because Acts doesn't mention that the apostles emphasize Christ dying on the cross for our sins or that it's his blood that redeems us doesn't mean they didn't preach it. It simply means that Luke, in writing Acts, doesn't mention it. Pablo, who told you he didn't receive it from the apostles? Where are where are you? Pablo, you know I love you, right? Put down the pipe, son. Put it down. Get off that TCH, the oil, and focus. Who told you he didn't receive it from the apostles? He received it from Jesus, confirmed it by going to the apostles. Okay. So what's the answer? Why is it in the book of Acts... We don't find Peter, John, James, or Paul ever preaching Christ died on the cross for your sins or shed his blood to redeem you. The answer is simple. That nowhere in the book of Acts are we told that Luke is giving us an exhaustive record of all the places the apostles preached at and all the peoples that the apostles preached to. Therefore, just because Luke doesn't mention that this was part of their preaching doesn't mean they didn't preach it. All you can prove is that Luke didn't mention it. That's it. You with me there? That's the most you can prove from the book of Acts, that Luke didn't mention all the sermons, all the peoples that the apostles preached to. Therefore, we are not certain that this wasn't part of their proclamation. Because in Luke, he's giving you select sermons of the apostles. And he's only mentioning some of the places that they went to and some of the people that they reached. Now, Luke may have had his reasons by inspiration not to emphasize that part of their proclamation. But the most you're proving with this argument is that Luke simply didn't mention it. You with me there? Luke simply didn't mention it. However, what the, what are they going to do? I'm going to have to do a part three on this. 
What are they going to do? They're going to say, but yeah, but Paul in his letters, when he's writing to Christians, mentions and emphasizes the blood. Well, hold on. Two responses to that. Pay attention, Pablo, because you asked me to do this. You got to listen and learn the argument. Two responses to that. Number one, Paul again is, is writing to congregations of believers. The people he's writing to are people who have already come to faith, have made a profession of faith, and claim to be Christians. Secondly, you find the emphasis on the blood of Jesus also in the writings of John and Peter. Seek the truth. Sorry, man. You're not one to be talking about disrespect when you Muslims disrespect us by mocking our God, blaspheming our Jesus, attacking our Bible, accusing it of being filled with contradictions, pornography, mocking Jesus being God who was born from a woman, right? Came out of a woman, hanging naked on the cross. So don't play victim here. If you can dish it out, then you can take it. Okay. Are you understanding my argument now before I move on? Let me repeat my arguments so I can then show you. The most that you prove from the book of Acts is that Luke, for some reason, did not emphasize that part of the proclamation of the gospel, which focused on Christ dying on the cross for our sins and shedding his blood to redeem us. In other words, just because Luke doesn't mention that's what they preached, doesn't prove they didn't preach that part of the gospel. You with me there? If you're understanding me, I want because I want to move on to the next point. Okay. So in Acts, not even Paul, when he's preaching unbelievers, do we find Luke ever mentioning as he's <clears throat> recalling Paul's travels? We don't even find Luke in Acts mentioning Paul specifically saying to unbelievers, Hey, Christ died on the cross for your sins and shed his blood to redeem you. So do not let them misuse Acts this way. Because if they're going to be consistent in using Acts this way, they end up refuting their own argument because it proves that even Paul didn't preach the blood. Right? So what are they going to come back with? Ah, oh, but Paul did mention it in his letters. Thank you, Andrew Martin. See, Andrew knows how to answer it. There's only so much you can fill in a papyrus. And so each author had to be intentional as he's guided by the Spirit what to include and what to omit. See, man, Andrew, you're ready to become a Christian apologist. And in due course, you will be in Jesus' name. Okay, now, if they come back to you and say to you, yeah, but Paul in his letters emphasizes the blood. Two responses. Are you ready? Two responses to that. How do you respond to that? Two responses. Are you ready? Are you ready for the two responses? Number one, Paul is writing to congregation of believers. They are not unbelievers, but believers who have made a profession of faith. So that still doesn't prove your point. Because their point is, when Paul preached the gospel to unbelievers, part of the proclamation to unbelievers, the Gentiles was, emphasizing they're redeemed by the blood of Christ, which they received by faith. Paul's letters are directed to believers, not unbelievers. That's one. Number two, even the other apostles in their own inspired letters, also mentioned the blood. Paul wasn't the only one. Do you know that? Paul is not the only inspired writer to emphasize the blood of Christ in his writings to believers because John and Peter do the same thing in their letters. Are you with me there? Now, can I prove that to you? Let's look at one passage by Paul where he focuses on the blood. Romans 3, 25 to 26. Romans 3, 25 to 26. Darius Cole, you're getting it. Romans 3, 25 to 26. Thank you, Lynx. God bless you. Yes, the other is what it came from the Holy Spirit. Guys, let's not talk about irrelevant issues like flat earth and the moon landing was fake. Focus on Jesus. Romans 3, 25, 26. Read with me. 
whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Propitiation through faith in his blood. See, the blood of Jesus propitiates, appeases God's wrath, and you receive it by faith. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. That God waited patiently, overlooked our sins, because he knew he'd forgive our sins when we believed in Jesus Christ. Verse 26. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So you, you see, G Paul emphasized the blood of Jesus, cleansing you of your sins, which you see by faith. Hold on. Let's go to 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19. Okay, I will, Captain, because you are a brother in Christ. You've proven yourself, so I trust you. There you go. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19. Love life. I love you, man. All right. I know where you live. Love life. All right. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19. Read with me. Watch here. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation, way of life, received by tradition from your fathers, the lifestyle that you inherited by your parents, but you've been redeemed. Notice 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Whoa. Peter also mentions you're redeemed by the blood of Jesus, the lamb. First Peter 1, 19. Hmm. Peter also mentions you've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb, our Lord Jesus. Did you guys catch it or no? Glenn, keep praying that I walk worthy of the Lord, not in the flesh, crucify the flesh, because I got anger issues, impatience, and I can get you angry and cause you to stumble. All right? Habibi Sam speaks Aramaic, which is the language of our Lord, language of heaven. Jesus is the only Savior. Don't hate, hater. Arabic is a corrupt form of Aramaic, you hater. Okay? Focus. Now let's go to 1 Peter 3.18. 1 Peter 3.18. 1 Peter 3.18. I love you too, John 3.17. Guys, focus. 1 Peter 3.18. All right, sorry for the delay. We're just waiting for his brother to post. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Why did he suffer? For our sins. He being the just, suffering for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So even Peter emphasized that Christ suffered and died for our sins. We who are unjust to bring us closer to God. Interesting. Now we're going to look at 1 Peter 2.24, but we're going to read 21 to 25. Write it down. 1 Peter 2, verse 24, but we're going to read 21 to 25 for context. And here Peter alludes to the prophecy of Isaiah 53. 1 Peter 2, 24, but 21 to 25 for the context, as the Holy Spirit enables me to recall scriptures and interpret them correctly for the glory of Christ. Everything good and perfect from the Holy Spirit of our God. <clears throat> 1 Peter 2, 21, 25, pay attention to 24. Protestant, what's happening to you, man? You're getting discombobulated. 1 Peter 2, 24, but 21, 25 for context. Let me read 24 since Protestant, he's a protester. So it's expected he's going to protest my commands because that's what Protestants do. They always want to reform us and protest against our wishes. 1 Peter 2, 24, but 21 to 25 for context. Who his own self, in his own soul, bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Wow. So why was he... Killed on a tree, hung on a tree, nailed on a tree, because he bore our sins. He was being punished for our sins on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. His wounds heal us. Now let's start 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving, leaving us an example, that we should follow his steps. Who did no sin, Jesus is sinless, Neither was guile, deceit found in his mouth, right? 
So let's read 23, 24 and 25 again. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. By whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Question. Since we fall, find Peter in his own epistles, speaking of Jesus shedding his blood as a lamb to redeem us, Jesus healing us by his wounds, which were inflicted upon him when he was beaten and hung on a tree, bearing our sins in his body on the tree to make us righteous and to bring us to God. How in the world can you then tell me that Paul was given a revelation which said that a person is redeemed by the blood of Christ through faith in that blood, and this revelation was not made known to the other apostles until Paul's conversion when he was sent to the Gentiles, when we find Peter in his epistles, and I'm going to show you John next teaching the same thing, and then we find our Lord Jesus teaching that message long before Paul's conversion, as I demonstrated in the first part of the session and the beginning of the second session. You with me there? Lois, why did you, Lois, why are you bringing the same objection I just refuted uh, 40 minutes ago? Honestly, sister, are you having a hard time understanding my argument? Loris, why did you just bring up the same argument from Galatians 2 that I addressed earlier and showed you how they would refute you? Hold on, let me just see what's wrong with Lois. Loris, I keep calling her Lois. Sister, what's wrong? You, am I speaking too fast? I just want to make sure. Why would you mention again that argument about Galatians 2 when they're going to tell you that 14 years later, Paul is told by Revelation to go back and reconfirm with the apostles, with the apostles and James, the Lord's brother, that the gospel he's been preaching for 14 years is the true gospel received by Jesus Christ in order to silence the Judaizers who are opposing him and claiming he's teaching a false gospel. Galatians 2 works in their favor against you because they're going to tell you this revelation that God gave to Paul. He then made it known to the apostles and the apostles amend it because they go, yeah, you are an apostle confirmed by Jesus. So now Jesus re revealed something new to you and we're on board, Paul. And then 14 years later, he goes back to make sure. Are you still on board? You still agree with this revelation given to me? Yeah, we do. That's not going to help your case, Loris. Stop using Galatians 2 and bad arguments because you're going to make them look strong in their refutation of your position. I'm trying to help you by the grace of God's spirit to make the best argument biblically. Right? So stop imagining an objection that you think will work against them, which won't. It will backfire against you. Okay, Laura's sister. Hold on. All right. Okay. Coming back to the issue. Everyone with me so far, how you refute these individuals? If they tell you nowhere in the book of Acts did the apostles preach that Christ died on the cross for our sins and that his blood was shed to redeem us, which received by faith. Well, the same book of Acts says, neither did Paul. Nowhere will you find in the book of Acts Paul preaching that message. If they then say, well, yeah, Paul preached it in his letters, well, then by the same token, so did Peter and John. They preached the blood in their letters as well. So you see, no matter what they say, they're going to end up refuting themselves. Are you with me there? 
Are you understanding the point? Pablo, why are you misquoting Paul? Why are you misquoting Paul when in Galatians 2, Paul's point is that the gospel was revealed to him from Jesus Christ. He didn't need to receive it from them. He didn't need their approval, but he still went ahead and got their approval for the sake of the others who may not have been convinced that Jesus appeared to Paul. Pablo, why are you misquoting the scriptures, brother? No, First Peter would have been written long after Paul's conversion. Okay. With me so far, folks? Are you with me? But whether it's written before or after, it's irrelevant to the point. Medic, you understand their argument? Let me repeat the argument, man. This is becoming harder. I didn't think it was going to be so hard for you guys to understand this. I'm like baffled. Why are you? Why is it hard? Honestly, it's not hard. It's simple. Why is it hard? I don't get it. Let me repeat it again. Let me try it again. One more time. This is why if you stop with the side talk, you'll get it, folks. Stop with the side talk. Listen for your benefit. I want to help you to deal with this. If not, go embrace it. And Pablo, of anyone, should be listening because I'm doing it for you. Listen, please, for your sake, so you don't be misled. The argument is... The argument is, in the book of Acts, the apostles never preach Christ died on the cross for our sins, nor did they preach that the blood of Jesus redeems you, which you receive by faith. Now, if they mention that argument, the response is, this is now, I think, about the sixth time, if not more, I'm repeating. It's okay, I don't mind repeating if you're listening. The response is, well, in the same book of Acts, the same book of Acts, Paul nowhere preaches that Christ died on the cross for our sins or shed his blood to redeem us, which is by faith. So even Acts proves that even Paul didn't preach that. It proves too much. No, pa Pablo, we're not asking whether this is your question. I know what your question is. Your question is, why did Paul say that he didn't need to get that gospel and he didn't receive it and hear it from the other apostles. I got your question, Pablo. Listen to my answer. You're misquoting him. Go to Galatians 1, chapter 1, verse 10, and read all the way to chapter 2, verse 10. You read him out of context. Let me read him in context for you. Paul says that the revelation of the gospel was given to him from Jesus Christ himself. Therefore, he was in no need to have humans confirm it. He didn't need their approval. But the same Paul says, nonetheless, I did go and seek their approval. I did meet Peter and James to make sure that they confirmed that this gospel did come from Jesus Christ. Why? For the sake of others, lest they think that Paul is crazy or a liar or deceived and a deceiver. You with me there? You with me there now? The problem with you, Pablo, and I'm going to tell you what your problem is. You're not reading the Bible. I guarantee you're not. You're hearing sermons where people take verses. You hear them quote the verses, but you don't go back and read the chapter to see what those verses mean in the chapter. Why aren't you going back and reading the chapters, brother? Why are you a babe being spoon-fed? You have a Bible. Why don't you open it? If they say Galatians 1, then go read it for yourself. Why are you that lazy, brother? You get my point now? You're being spiritually, intellectually lazy, Pablo, and I'm going to say it as a brother, and I know it because you hear a sermon, they quote one verse, oh my goodness, did you ever think about then going opening that chapter and reading the verse in the context of the chapter, or you just take them at their word? 
Thank you, Captain Ron. Are you with me there now? Now, are you ever going to tell me, Pablo, that why did Paul say I didn't need their approval? I didn't seek their approval when I just told you what Paul meant in context. Robert, I don't even care what they say about you. They've said so many bad things, and I said, shame on you. Even though Robert Bobby may be a jerk, he's still a jerk I love. He's my jerk. You get it now, Pablo, or no? Pablo, I don't know, man. Have you been following me for the past hour? Hey, folks, let me, let me ask the question for every one of you. Have I not demonstrated and proved that the apostles preached the same gospel to the Jews as Paul did to the Gentiles in the book of Acts? Have I not been demonstrating that for the past hour or so? Pablo, are you, are you here listening to me, brother? Everyone got it. I don't know why you're not getting it. I just demonstrated. Oh, my goodness. Okay, Pablo. My brother. Adios, amigos. All right, brother. Bye-bye, uh, my brother. Sorry. I love you, man. I really love you. And I love you so much. Shalom, my friend. Shalom. No one understands this question, but only Pablo. Okay. Anyway, for the rest of you, no, defending Christianity, he's been having this problem since the day I started answering this question for him. He just doesn't get it. There are places in which you can't make someone see. You got to leave it alone. Another thing I want to remind everyone, you cannot make anyone see. You can't make yourself see. So if you see a person's not getting it, that's a sign he's not there yet. The Holy Spirit hasn't enabled him to see it. Leave it alone. Let me repeat it again. You cannot force someone to see something. You can't make yourself see, let alone make someone else see. That's the work of the Holy Spirit of the living God. So when you see a person is not getting it, because this is not the only time he's not getting it. He didn't get it the first time I did this session. He didn't get it in, in messages he sent me where I clarified it. You just can't make someone see. Then you got to let it go. Tell them, give it up. Put it on the shelf. Don't worry about it. You're not there yet to see it. The time will come by the grace of God's spirit. You'll be able to see it. Thank you, Tommy. God bless you. May the Lord Jesus save your son out of Islam and cover him by his precious blood. Okay? You with me there? Is that clear to everyone? This took much longer than I anticipated. Even though I have to be rough and tough, I pray that you see I'm doing it hopefully in a spirit of love. For the sake of the Lord. But once I see you can't see it, don't ask me the question. Because I can't make you see it. Folks, I am not the Holy Spirit. You're not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of the living God, He is almighty. He enables us to see. Right? Right? So, if you're not getting it, shelve it. Don't worry about it. Don't focus on it. There's some things we won't get. It will come when the Holy Spirit wants us to get it. It will come when the Holy Spirit wants us to get it, honestly. So now I see Pablo just won't get it. He's not going to get it, and I'm wasting his time. And I don't say this to be rude. He's wasting my time because I cannot give eyes to see. I can't make myself see. So I want to emphasize that for you Christian teachers, evangelists, apostles. Your job is not to make someone see. You preach the truth as clearly as possible, as accurately as possible. And if they still don't get it, no more. Move on. Because that means the Holy Spirit isn't pleased to allow that person to see it at that moment. He will enable him to see it in time if the Holy Spirit is pleased to give him that grace. The Holy Spirit is God Almighty. He converts. He illuminates. He opens hearts. He opens ears. He opens eyes. He opens minds. Thank you, Tommy. Amen. Instead of shoving it down his throat. Let me prove it to you. It is the work of the trying God to open minds to understand. Luke 24, 44, 45. Thank you, Philip Rene. To the outsiders who showed they were stiff-necked, Philip Rene, stubborn and hated God and his truth, the Lord refused to speak clearly to them anymore. 
He spoke parables because he was fed up with their stubbornness, their sin, their hatred, their opposition. Right? Amen, Cheryl. Luke 24, 44, 45. Okay. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all the things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Now notice 45. Then opened he their understanding. Bam. There you go, folks. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Exactly, Bill Thompson. So if the Holy Spirit, in union with the Father and Son, does not open your mind to understand, do you think you're going to make someone understand? Do you think you're going to understand? Do you see it, 45? Is that clear? Okay. John 14, 26. I'm almost ready to wrap this up, but I got to do another session. Yeah, hit the like button, please. John 14, 26. Please, yeah, hit the like button so we can make this YouTube page explode in time. Exactly, Tommy. God bless you. Holy Spirit uses imperfect vessels like me. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Read that again, folks. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, John 16, 12 to 13. John 16, 12 to 13. When you send me the ticket to come out and teach, God will, will be ready. God will be ready. I don't know how to pronounce your name, man. Oh, God to be ready. Go to be ready. All right, man, man, your name. Why you got a name that's like a tongue twister? John 16, 12 to 23. Exactly, Captain Ron. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Guys, etch this in your hearts and your minds. Read. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. I wish I can tell you more, but you can't handle it. Notice 13. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Did you catch it? Even Jesus said, there are things you can't handle. There are things I can't speak to you about. You can't handle them. So I'm going to leave those things for now. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he will empower you to be able to handle those things, understand those things, and then proclaim them. God bless you, Tommy, man. The Lord bless you. I need it, Black Smurf. Keep praying because I'm getting attacked viciously by Satan. But we're covered by the blood of Jesus. Did you see that now? Did you see what our Lord said? Even to Jesus is, guys, Jesus is God in the flesh. God in the flesh is saying, you're not ready. You can't handle what I'm about to show you. Not now. So I'm going to refrain from sharing it with you. Do you see? Man, God is saying to them, you can't handle what I'm about to show you, what I want to share with you. So I'm going to refrain from sharing it. But the Holy Spirit will come and continue my work of illuminating you, enabling you to understand. What's the point? If Jesus himself refrained from sharing things because his audience were not ready to handle them, then are you more qualified to teach than Jesus? Are you a better discerner of hearts than Jesus? If Jesus refrains, that means you have to have wisdom to refrain as well. If you see someone's not getting it, stop. All right, hey, bro, you know what? Pray on it. Hey, sister, pray on it. You'll get it in time right now. It's not for you to get it now. 
right? In time, you'll get it by the grace of God. Do you see it? Yep, it is, Anzo. This shows that you have an ongoing, personal, intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit, Enzo, because the Holy Spirit is constantly with you, teaching you, guiding you, loving you, convicting you, protecting you, preserving you, disciplining you, training you, rebuking you. Okay? Final example, Acts 16, 14. Exactly, Bill Thompson. Acts 16, 14. Exactly, cult finder. Yep, exactly. Humbling you, King of Kings. Acts 16, 14. And I got to just make one more point, wrap it up. But I got to do a part three to this because I got to go through the book of Acts and see what message they preached. Did they preach that water baptism saves you? Acts 16, 14. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us. Whose heart the Lord opened? Wow. Whose heart the Lord opened? Let me repeat it again. Whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of God? So Luke 24, 45 says, The Lord Jesus opened the minds of the apostles to understand the scriptures. In John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit will come and teach the apostles all things and remind them of the things that Jesus said. In John 16, 12 to 13, our Lord says, there are things that you can't handle now that I can't teach you because you can't understand them. But when the Holy Spirit comes, then he'll teach you all things and enable you to understand the things that you're not ready for right now and reveal new things to you. And here in Acts 16, 14, the Lord Jesus had to open the heart of Lydia to understand the gospel of Paul and accept it. Right? So I cannot make people see. I can't make Pablo see. So it's now clear to me, Pablo can't take this in. He's not ready. And the end time, the Holy Spirit will enable him to see it. Thank you, Glenn. May the Holy Spirit open my eyes more and more. Yes, I was Darius. Now, Let's look at John. Did John teach in his epistles the same message that Paul preached in his epistles? Right? Did John teach the same gospel in his epistles that Paul preached in his epistles? Namely, that God is propitiated, satisfied, his anger is removed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's see. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. And this was a very long session. Too long. First John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Sure sounds like what Paul preached. Yeah, Medic, if you guys want me to do another session, it'll be my pleasure because I got at least another two hours. But let's talk about that after this. Are you paying attention, Medic? Did John in 1 John 1, 7 say, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our sins? 1 John 2, verses 1 to 2. 1 John 2, verses 1 to 2. Thank you, Tommy. Sadly, Bill Thompson, it is. 1 John 2, verses 1 to 2. Yeah. First John 2, verses 1 to 2. My little children, these things write unto you, write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. Notice that word, propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So the Lord Jesus propitiates God, satisfies God, appeases God, removes his wrath by his blood. Did you catch it? 
1 John 4.10. 1 John 4.10. Notice the word propitiation. Thank you, King of Kings. Thank the Lord. 1 John 4.10. First John 4.10. Watch here. Propitiation means what I just said, medic. I repeated it. Propitiate means to appease God, to satisfy God's justice, to remove his anger from sin, to propitiate him, to appease him, to satisfy him, to remove his anger and displeasure. First John 4.10. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be... To be the propitiation for our sins. So notice what John taught. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Christ offered himself to propitiate God, to appease God, to remove God's anger and satisfy God's holiness. And how did he do it? Do it? By his death, by the shedding of his blood. Now let's see what Paul said in Romans 3.25 to see if John sounds like Paul and if Paul sounds like John. Romans 3.25. Romans 3.25. Then Peter said, oh, well, LAFC, Acts 2.38, I'm going to decimate your misuse of it in the next session. Stick around, LAFC. If you're really courageous, no, don't block them. It's all right. And you really think this passage proves your point, stick around because this is the passage I'm going to exegete, exegete and decimate your shameless butchering of this passage. Romans 3.25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Sounds like John, right? Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Wait, John said the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Jesus is our advocate, the righteous one, who offers himself as a propitiation for our sins. Sure sounds like Paul and John. Knew the same gospel and preached the same message, right? Sure, sure sounds like Peter preached the same message. And 1 Peter 1, 18, 19, which we already looked at. 1 Peter 2, 24. Context is 21 and 25. And 1 Peter 3, 18. Sure sounds like they all preach the same message in their epistles. But wait, we believe the Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John, who wrote the epistles, also wrote Revelation. Now let's see what John teaches in Revelation. Revelation 1, 5 to 6. Revelation 1, 5 to 6. Revelation 1, 5 to 6. We got two more passages in Revelation. I'm going to wrap it up. Then I'm going to ask you what you want me to do in the next session. Because we're going to take a 20-minute break, God willing, if the Lord wills. And I'm going to start another session. Another live stream. Right after this one, if you guys want. And I'll ask you which of the two topics you want me to address. But let's first look at Revelation 1, 5 to 6. I don't know. I have two topics in mind that I need to finish, but we'll see. Let's see, Zena. Revelation 1, 5 to 6. Thank you, Kay. Hallelujah, brother. If you're a sister, hallelujah, sister. Revelation 1, 5 to 6. And from Jesus Christ, pay attention here, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, notice this, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. <whistles> Jesus, you see this clown here, LAFC? You see the clown? This clown... Obviously didn't listen to part one and part two where I decimated this shameless perversion of the book of Acts. Supposedly it's a transition from the Jews to Gentiles. Hey, clown, have you been listening? I just decimated your false interpretation of Acts. In fact, LAFC, I'm going to make it easy. He's one of these clowns that believes his doctrine. Uh, Bozo, or I should call you Cookie, watch here. Can you quote a single verse in the book of Acts? where Paul says Christ died on the cross for your sins in the book of Acts. LAFC, answer, I'm going to block you. Can you quote a single verse in the book of Acts where Paul says Christ died on the cross for your sins or a single verse in the book of Acts where Paul said we're redeemed by the blood of Christ in the book of Acts? 
See, now he's going to prove my point, folks. See, God brought him here. God brought him here to confirm the power of this exegesis. Thank you, Lord, for bringing one of these guys. LFC, don't tap dance around my question. Notice the tap dance, the coward. Did the 12 do it? Let me repeat my question again. Can you show me in the book of Acts a single verse where Paul says Christ died on the cross for our sins or shed his blood to redeem us by faith? In the book of Acts, can you, yes or no? I don't care what your argument is. You just said Acts is a transitional phase from the Jews to Jews. Ah, he admitted. Thank you, Lord. Busted. Guys, do you now see that the arguments are giving you are irrefutable exegetically? Take a screenshot of this. No, I can't. Busted. Yep. Let me be the bully and spank people, Zina. Thank you. Did you catch it? Busted. Did I tell you they won't be able to refute you and their argument proves too much and embarrasses them? Do you guys now see the proof? Okay, I want you, you got it, right? Now, LAFC, thank you for admitting your position is so unbiblical that it got decimated. It had everything to do with the gospel because you just appealed to the book of Acts, L-A-F-C. You appealed to the book of Acts saying it's a transition from what they preached to the Jews to then what was preached to the Jews and Gentiles. Don't retract your position. You're only going to embarrass yourself even further. Now, do me a favor. If you don't want to get blocked or bounced, let me finish the point. Don't chime in. Darius, my brother, I love you know that, right? I know I frustrate you, and sometimes you frustrate me. LAFC is an advocate for the position I've been refuting for the past two hours, Darius. So what are you asking me? What angle is he trying to play? Brother, you've been here for two hours. What have I been refuting for two hours? The very position this gentleman has been espousing. Exactly. Taylor Swift. No, no, love life is okay. He's a fellow Chaldean who just wants to have me come over and lay hands on him out of love. Make me. Were you here from the beginning? I said there's a form of dispensationalists that teach that up until Paul's conversion, the gospel that the apostles were sent to preach to the Jews was, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. It wasn't until Paul was converted that God then revealed to Paul that you're redeemed by the blood which you received by faith, and that was the message from Paul onwards. Yes, that's what you are saying. Yes, you are. Okay. Okay. And let's see, articulate your position. Go ahead real quickly because I'm going to end up further embarrassing yourself because you don't learn. What position are you articulating from Acts? You said transition from Jews to Jews and Gentiles. What was that transition? Guys, watch. He's going to end up confirming the point, even though it says that's not what I'm saying. What was the transition? You're wasting my time. It's already been over two hours. Let's do it. So they did not teach faith alone until when? Until when? Exactly, Darius Cole. Until when? See, notice he, the liar, he just got busted again. He just said, that's not my argument, but he just said, faith alone on what Jesus did. You see what a wicked liar this guy is? He just said, that's not his position, but he just said, it is his position. Did you just catch it? Faith alone in what Jesus did. Well, wait, wait, what did Jesus do? Die on the cross for your sins, which you receive by faith. I just said, that's your position, which you just lied and said, it isn't your position. 
You see what, how, how disgusting and wicked this guy is? LAFC, let me repeat it again because I'm going to block you. You're saying, you're saying, let me repeat it again. You're saying that the message that salvation comes by what Jesus did on the cross and dying for our sins and shedding his blood, which you received by faith alone, wasn't known until Paul's conversion, right? Right? Oh, my goodness. I'm going to give you a final shot. Did you not just say faith alone and what Christ did? Faith alone and what Christ did. I will. Hold on. Faith alone and what Christ did. LAFC, what did Christ do? No, 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 no. Finish your point. What did Christ do that brings about salvation when I have faith in him? What did Christ do? No, I understand you perfectly. I'm exposing you. What did Christ do which brings about salvation to those who believe in him? Let's try it again. You got less than a minute to, uh, to answer. Sorry, guys. I guess he, my question wasn't clear. Let me repeat my question one more time. What did Christ do to bring about salvation which you received by faith alone? Okay. So, did the apostles before that transition preach to the Jews that you need to believe in Christ for what he did for your salvation and dying on the cross for your sins? And shed, Okay, guys. Did I not just say that's their position and he just said it? Shed his blood? So why are you now lying and saying that I'm not representing your position correctly when you just repeated the very position I articulated was your position. No, Darius Cole, my brother, can you do me a favor and not help the heretics out? That took you a minute because you don't know their position. He's not you, Darius. Stop being a pacifist or someone who's trying to bring peace. You keep doing this, brother. I'm going to ask you nicely, stop. You had stayed away from me for a while because we were having differences. Stop chiming in and trying to be a pacifier. You're not helping the situation. You're not him. I expect you not to get it, but he knows his position. Okay. So you're saying that the apostles before Paul didn't preach what Jesus did, shedding his blood for their salvation, right? Because marijuana, he knows he's going to get destroyed. Let me repeat it again. You're saying that the apostles preached to the Jews initially, Jesus is the Messiah, but it wasn't until later when Paul was sent to the Gentiles, then they focused or Paul focused that the blood of Jesus saves you, which you receive by faith alone, right? Sorry, guys. I hope none of you guys are getting upset with me. I want you to learn because he's a test case now. He's a test study proving the validity of these arguments. Is that what you're saying, LAFC? You're saying that before Paul's conversion, when they preach to the Jews, they preach he's the Messiah. But then afterwards, when the Jews rejected Jesus, Paul was sent to preach to the Gentiles. See, folks, did I not say this is the position from the very beginning, which he denied? You see how much time he wasted by not being honest? Okay. Now let me repeat my question, LAFC. Can you show me a single place in the book of Acts where Paul preaches to the Gentiles, Jesus died for your sins, Jesus shed his blood for your sins? Can you show me? Don't worry, I'm going to send him as a merry way. Hold on. Can you quote a single verse in the book of Acts where Paul says to the Gentiles, Jesus is the Messiah who died on the cross for your sins and shed his blood to redeem you for your sins. Can you quote that verse? 
in the book of Acts, LAFC. Thank you. Now it's time for you to go bye-bye. Thank you for proving my point. That's all I wanted you to do. Thank you. See you later, friend. That's it. Praise Jesus Christ. Thank the Lord this guy came. He just confirmed to you the validity of my arguments. Are you not thankful? Don't you say, see, if you ha were having doubts, this is their position. And having doubts, this is how you refute their position. You just got a taste study, right? A uh, test study, not taste. A test study, right? Do you see it? Do you see how he collapsed? Because Acts doesn't confirm what he was saying. A test study. A case study, yes, and a test study as well. Right? Neville, brother, I love you. Level. Shalom, my friend. Shalom. Okay, you with me there? Okay. For the rest of you, and Andrew, for the rest of you, did you see I did represent their position correctly? And did you see their utter collapse in defending their position from the book of Acts? Do you see it? This is why, please don't chime in and tell me how to talk to them and try to then be a pacifist <clears throat> and their defense. Don't do that. You don't know what you're doing. Let me do what I'm doing by the grace of God. If I'm wrong, may the Spirit correct me and preserve me for His glory. So praise the Lord. You guys saw with your own eyes. You guys saw with your own eyes. I represented their position correctly and their failure to prove their position from the book of Acts. This was a godsend moment. You know that, right? This was a godsend moment. Let's finish it. Okay. Let's now finish with Revelation again. Five, chapter 5, verses 9 to 10. Revelation 5, 9 to 10. We need more fire and brimstone preaching. Bold, passionate preachers in your face won't back down and won't try to be effeminate or politically correct. I'm sick of that. You're not being Christ-like, brother. I don't see the love of Jesus in you. And I see what that approach has done to the churches. People who are Christ-like and gentle who are now capitulating to the world and accepting same-sex <clears throat> marriages and LGBT issues and other issues to pervert the gospel, bringing scandal to the churches and destroying the body. Relation 5, 9 to 10. Sorry, I'm not of that. I'm not cut out from that cloth. I'm not made of that cloth. I'm a Middle Easterner. I'm a Syrian. I'm angry. I'm mad. And I'm, and you're going to know about it. Relation 5, 9 to 10. It's not easy being an Assyrian. And they sung a new song saying, thou art Worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood, by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. You have redeemed us by your blood and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. So John, John the apostle in Revelation, in First John, in perfect agreement with Paul, teaches the blood of Jesus redeems us, washes us, cleanses us, and appeases God's wrath, and makes us kings and queens, ruling with God and serving him. So did Peter in 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19, 1 Peter 2, 24, 1 Peter 3, 18, all of which we already looked at. Right? With me there? Final one from John and Revelation. Final one. Final one from Revelation. Revelation 7. It's a long one, but I want every one of you to give your undivided attention to this section of Scripture. It is beautiful. 
because it says those who are redeemed of Christ will live with Christ forever in incorruptibility before the presence of God the Father. Revelation 7, 9 to 17. Pay attention. What made them worthy to stand before God on the throne? What made them worthy to serve God with God never being angry with them, but loving them perfectly forever? What made them worthy? Revelation 7, 9 to 17. Revelation 7, 9 to 17. After this, read with me, folks. Read with me. After this, I beheld a low, a, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds <clears throat> and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Now watch here. What made them worthy? And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. The answer is going to be in 14, but pay attention. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? Where are they from? Why are they in white robes? Why are they here? Notice the answer. Why are they here? Where are they from? Notice the answer. And I said unto him, sir, thou knowest. You know. You know better than me. I just got here in the spirit. You've been here. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Usually, if you have a white robe, blood being red stains it. But the blood of Jesus is so pure, so holy, it doesn't stain, it purifies and makes whiter than snow. Their white robes, their white robes signify their absolute purity and sinlessness. And the reason why they're absolutely pure, because the holy blood of Jesus made them absolutely pure. And then notice 15, because of that, because of the blood of the lamb, are they before the throne of God? And serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Why? Because the blood of Jesus made them so pure, so holy, so worthy, that God now delights to dwell with them because the blood of Jesus made them worthy and delighted the heart of God. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst no more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat, <clears throat> nor any heat. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, which is the Holy Spirit, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Did you catch it? Could Revelation be any clearer? The holy blood of the Lamb makes you absolutely pure and holy and perfect to the point that God delights in, to be in your presence, makes you worthy to get God's notice, and God says, I want to dwell with you. I want you to be before my throne day and night and never leave my presence. That's how pure you are in my sight because of the blood of my son. You caught it? Okay. So to repeat the passages, 1 Peter 1, 18, 19. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. 1 Peter 2, 24. 1 Peter 2, 24, reading 21 to 25 for context. 1 Peter 3, 18. 1 John 1, 7, chapter 1, verse 7. 1 John 1, 7. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. Revelation 1, verse 5, include verse 6. Revelation 1, verses 5 and 6. Revelation 5, verse 9, include 10. Revelation 5, 9 to 10. Revelation 7, 14, but you got to read Revelation 7, verses 9 to 17. Revelation 7, 9 to 17. All of these passages show John and Peter in agreement with Paul in passages such as Romans 3, 25 taught the same message. You are redeemed. You are saved. You are purified. You are made perfectly holy and worthy to stand in the presence of God Almighty forever where God now wants to dwell with you, delights to dwell with you because of the blood of Jesus, which received by grace through faith. Did you catch it? 
a long, intense session with a lot of distractions, a lot of attacks by the enemy. But the enemy lost again because the blood of Jesus that covers us gave us the victory again. And God gave us an additional brownie point, so to speak. Icing on the cake. He brought one of those who believe in this position. And you saw how easily he got refuted. Exactly, Medic. Did you see how easy it was to decimate their position? You saw it, right? What's the point? Here's my point. David Wood, Anthony Rogers, myself, Christian Prince, <clears throat> Al Fadi, I can name uh, more. We are giving you, thanks our brother first and last for posting the verses. We are giving you battle-tested arguments, arguments used in spiritual battle that will give you the victory by the power of the blood of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling you. We're giving you actual arguments that work to take every thought captive, every inclination captive, and make it obedient to Christ. Stuff that you won't learn in Bible colleges or seminaries. I guarantee you, you won't learn this stuff. You with me there? You with me there? So let me end this session with 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 6. And then we're going to come back in 20 more minutes. Are you guys tired or are you up for another session? In about 20, 30 minutes, I'm going to do a second session. But let's go to 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 6. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 6. It's hot in here. Woo. I will do another one because I'm leaving Wednesday, God willing, for LA. So I want to do as many sessions until I leave. But you got to hit that like button, subscribe to my channel, pass it on. I need more subscribers, folks. Second Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. Notice what Paul says. For though we walk in the flesh, because we're still in the flesh body, we do not war after the flesh. We don't use knives, guns, machetes, tanks. We don't use physical weapons. Because our weapons are what? Notice verse 4. Read with me. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical. They're not fleshly. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, destroying walls, taking cities captives, you know, casting down imaginations. Any imagination that puts itself above Christ, we cast it down. We demolish it. Notice the power of this language. This is war. This is full force attack. This is not... Jesus loves you. Bring it on. Yeah. Notice the language. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing into captivity, enslaving them, taking them captive. War booty. Right? Every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Does this sound like a wishy washy? pacifistic, effeminate apostle? Or does this sound like a warrior, a lion, ready to slay, destroy, demolish, not physically, but spiritually? Right? Right? So Paul wasn't one who's going to say, Jesus loves you, brother. I love you too. Did I offend you, sir? I'm sorry. Folks, you don't, start, you don't start riots. You don't start riots. Listen to me. You don't start riots, cause divisions, get beat up, and stone by being a wishy-washy effeminate. Read the book of Acts. Wherever Paul went, riots started. Arguments broke out. People divided, and people attacked him, stoned him, beat him, and he had to flee for his life. Does that sound that Paul was like some of these people? Brother, I don't see Jesus in you. Or does he sound like someone like me who will get in your face, shout in your face, get you angry enough to want to bust my face, break my jaw and headbutt me? What does he sound like? I don't see the love of Jesus in you, Sam. 
You're just so mean. Where's Jesus? Anyway. Yeah, Zena. If Paul was arguing via the internet, block, ban, and report to YouTube. My facial expressions are scary, aren't they? No wonder I'm single. The way I look, who's going to end up wanting to be with me, right? Anyway. Okay, folks, before I end it, I'm going to do another session in 20, 30 minutes. But here's the thing. Here's the two things. I can finish my message on the book of Acts because they keep quoting Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38 to show that Peter preached that water baptism saves you. So if you want me to finish this topic, and show you that in the book of Acts, the message of salvation wasn't one that said you had to get baptized to be saved, but it's a consistent message that you're saved by the grace of Jesus, which you're saved by faith. I can do that, or I can do part two of Jesus and Psalm 110. Which of the two do you want me to do? Do you want me to finish the gospel of Jesus Christ as preached in the book of Acts to show that water baptism doesn't save? And then do Jesus and Psalm 110 tomorrow, God willing. Okay, for those of you who want me to do the book of Acts, put Acts. For those who didn't do Psalm 110, put Psalm 110. Put Acts if you want me to do Acts. Put Psalm 110 if you want me to do Psalm 110. Yeah. It seems like Acts is winning. Okay, Acts it is. I got more people for Acts than I did for Psalm. Lord willing, we'll do Psalm 110 tomorrow. Thank you, Andrew. And Andrew wants Acts. All right. Andrew is our guest. If he wants Acts, let's honor him. We'll do Acts. Okay, what time is it now? Okay, it's 7.51, 7.52. I'll be back on at 8.30, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So it's now 8.52. I'll be back at 9.30 Eastern Standard Time, which is 8.30 Central Standard Time. So you guys will be here? Seek, you got to be patient. Sabr, be patient. It's okay. He can wait. We'll do it next one. So you guys ready? Right now, it's 7.52 Central Standard Time, which is 8.52 Eastern Standard Time, New York time. So we'll be on 9.30, 8.30, which means we'll be on in about 40 minutes. So Lord Jesus willing, we'll be back on. In 40 minutes. Andrew Martin in about 40 minutes. Okay? Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We love you. 40 minutes. See you soon.